put our hands together and make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Amen. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with sin. Amen. Wow. You Hallelujah. look good today. Hallelujah. Amen. The Lord is good. Amen. Hallelujah. I said the Lord is good in all of his ways. Hey, he's even good when we get a little snowflake on Sunday morning. Amen. I saw those things coming out my window today, and I thought, oh, Lord, help us. Help us. This has been the winter when uh, the weather has always showed up on Sunday or on the weekend. I don't know why. It's a preacher's nightmare, let me tell you. But uh, we're here today. Amen. I said we're here today, Church Alive. We're here. I had a lot of calls today. Different ones couldn't come. Some sick today. We're going to have a special time of prayer during this service in a few moments, and we're going to really pray. I've come. I'm going to be honest with you. I've come today. I told Brother Keith a moment ago, uh, in spite of the hindrances all week long and even today, I have had a spirit of expectation in my spirit and in my heart, and I believe the Holy Spirit is going to meet with us today in a special way. How many just agree with Pastor on that? I didn't come today like you. I didn't come just to go through a motion. I didn't come just to go through the mechanics of having a church service today. I know what's in your heart, same thing that's in my heart. I came to worship the Lord. Amen. I came to bless His name. I came to exalt Him. And as we used to sing years ago, and I believe it's true, when the praises go up, the blessings come down. Amen. They fall down. Let's pray. and Let's continue to invite the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost to be with us. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to worship you. We bless your name. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, use this worship time. Use this service. I believe even now, Lord, there are mighty and great your people in this place today. Oh, Father, we praise you. We honor you. We have a spirit of expectation in our heart today for the great things you're doing. We worship you in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, come on, let's put our hands together and let's continue to worship the Lord today. familiar with it. We just finished a month-long reading of the book of Acts. Some of us joined in the challenge, and you would find that it was a very dramatic experience for Saul. He was stricken blind. He went three days thinking, no doubt, wondering, what did I just experience? What voice that I heard from heaven. When Ananias came and he laid his hands on Saul, the Bible says that the scales from his eyes fell off. He received his sight. And he was gloriously saved. How do I know he was saved? Well, the Bible says he was a chosen vessel to the Lord. And one of the reasons I know he was saved was he began to bear fruit 
of his salvation experience. All these last couple of Sundays, I've preached about God's the potter, we're the clay. We're not saved by works, but after we're saved, we're created in Christ to produce good works. Well, you can look at the apostle's life and see the works and the fruits of his labor throughout the New Testament. It was a drastic conversion that took place in his life. And these verses remind us today that there was a purpose, there was a destiny, there was a plan that God had, I believe, before the time began for Saul's life. It says he is a chosen, he says he's a chosen vessel to me, the Lord says. He's going to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel, and he'll also suffer some things. Now, I want to read another passage, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, toward the end of Paul's life, the end of his ministry. He was writing to Timothy, and he says in many regard as his farewell message, 2 Timothy chapter 4, Verse 6, he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Is anybody else here also looking for the appearing of the, of the Lord today? What a promise to Paul. What a promise to us. And he knew he was getting close to inheriting that crown of righteousness. This is a picture. This is a portrait of what I have been preaching the last couple of weeks with a person with a name, a face, skin on. This We can see how God worked, moved, breathed, operated on such a spiritual giant of a person, a man, as we have come to reference and know in the Bible as the Apostle Paul. God took this life as a chosen vessel, and he did many miraculous and supernatural things through his life. Can I tell you something today? God, I want to say it, I said the last two weeks, God may not call every one of us things that he called the Apostle Paul to, but I declare from this pulpit today, God has a divine plan. God has a divine destiny. God has divine purpose for every one of our lives who are sitting here under the sound of my voice at Church Alive today. If you agree with that, would you help me give God praise that he's got a great plan for your life today? And today I've come to share this little thought about our greatest accomplishments. Our greatest accomplishments. When you look at the Apostle Paul, I'm just going to reference a few of these things here at the very beginning. When you look at the Apostle Paul's life, he started out, we know, as one of Christianity's most zealous enemies. Yet, while he was a persecutor of the church, and he actually helped, had a hand in, St in Stephen stoning, and he imprisoned Christians early in his life, yet he was a person handpicked by Jesus to become one of the gospel's greatest messengers and preachers of the word. Paul, we understand, traveled tirelessly through the ancient world, through Greece, through Rome, through... Asia Minor, all these areas of the known world at that time. He tirelessly traveled through these areas, taking the message of salvation as God said he would to the Gentiles. This happens primarily, the Bible tells us, because Saul of Tarsus, who was later renamed Paul, 
on this road to Damascus had a vision of the resurrected Jesus on the Damascus road. And this began Saul's conversion to Christianity. In short, we can say these few things as a, as a Reader's Digest version about Paul's life. Number one, Paul made three long missionary journeys throughout the Roman Empire, planting churches, preaching the gospel, and giving strength and encouragement to the early church. We also know this about his life and ministry. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, Paul is credited uh, by most theologians as the author of at least 13 of the New Testament books. We understand that according to history and the scripture, Paul was proud of his Jewish heritage. It's believed that he had a Jewish heritage, yet he was a Roman citizen. And Paul saw that this gospel, however, was just not for Jerusalem, just not for his fellow Jewish believers, but it was for the entire world. It was for the Gentiles as well. Another highlight of Paul's life and ministry, yes, he had much persecution, but Paul was eventually, historians believe, martyred for his faith in Christ some say by the Romans around 64 or 65 A.D., and some believe that the execution that Paul suffered, I don't think we really know for certain, but some believe that the apostle was beheaded for the cause of Christ. We know this today for sure. Paul had a brilliant mind. Paul had a commanding knowledge of the Scripture he was educated by one of the most noted scholars of his day, a man by the name of Gamaliel, who taught him the Torah, taught him the Scripture. At the same time, we understand that though t Paul was educated in many ways, he was able to explain the gospel message through his letters and his writings at a very foundational level in a way that early believers and converts could understand oh what accomplishments Paul had in his life some tradition portrays Paul I thought this is interesting they portray Paul as physically a small man and we know according to the text according to the Bible that the Apostle Paul he suffered many physical hardships and missionary on his missionary journeys and on planning the churches. I, I'm not going to list all of them, but think about this. Paul experienced heavy persecution. Paul experienced several beatings listed in the book of Acts. He was, uh, I, this word in King James Version says, he was flogged. I, does anybody here... Has anybody here know what flogging is or has ever? I hope you've never experienced flogging, but it's, it's something that you never want to have to go through. But he experienced this multiple times, run out of cities for preaching the gospel. We know that if five times at least um, that he was beaten with 40 stripes save one. We know that he was shipwrecked. He was left out at sea for a day and a night, the Scripture says. He was in prison. Here's a man who used to put Christians in jail. Now he himself experienced imprisonment for preaching the Word of God and for believing in Jesus' resurrection and telling the good news gospel message. Paul was under house arrest. Paul was threatened many times. Paul was left cold and naked. One place the scripture says he was let down in a basket out of a window just to escape some persecution from preaching the word of God. Many times in the apostle's life, he was hungry physically. He suffered many things, yet God used him mightily for the kingdom of God and for the
the glory of God. I'm sure Judge Paul must have been reminded many times of what Jesus told his disciples. He said, you may suffer with me, but if you suffer with me, one day you're also going to reign with me. Hallelujah. Anybody glad? The godly today, the Bible says they shall sometimes suffer persecution. But listen, we may carry a cross from time to time. We may suffer a blow from time to time. But the God that the apostle Paul served, he's the God that's faithful to you and me. Hallelujah. And he's going to be with us. Just as he was with Saul and with Paul. Oh, if you're glad about it, somebody help me give God praise. All of these things give us a profile of Paul's life. We also know many other things. Take the time to share in this sermon. But this is the life lesson Holy Spirit sent me with. After examining this profile and all the things that he boasted or could boast of his accomplishments, of the fruit that God worked through him. You know, there was things, other things as well in his life he could have boasted of. You know, Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, he was a religious person. Did you know he was a Pharisee? He could have boasted of that. He was a tent maker. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. All of these things. He could say, these are my accomplishments. But I came today sent by Holy Spirit with this word, this life lesson that says to me and to you today, the greatest accomplishments I believe that the apostle could point to in his life, boil down to these four simple things in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. As he's getting ready, perhaps to be executed, perhaps to be beheaded for the cause of Christ, he writes his protege. He writes a young man he had been mentoring in the gospel, and he lets him know my departure is soon at hand. Um, no doubt many things were flooding his heart. Many things were flooding his mind. Even perhaps that first initial experience on the road to Damascus in his conversion to Christ and the receiving of salvation for his own life. But with all of these things he could have spoken to or said, look at these accomplishments. Uh, these are the things that he told Timothy uh, number one, he said, Timothy, uh, these are the greatest accomplishments of my life. Number one, uh, I have fought uh, a good fight. Uh, number two, I have finished the race. Uh, number three, I have kept the faith. Uh, and number four, Timothy, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord himself shall give me on that day. Uh, but not only to me, Timothy, but also to all all those who love his appearing. Oh, hallelujah. I hope you catch what the Holy Spirit has put in my heart this morning. Church, a lot of things could be said about this great apostle. All these books in the Bible ascribed to him, but there's probably nothing greater that could be said of Paul except to say Paul knew what it was uh, to fight the good fight of faith. Uh, and with that, I say to us today, church, uh, Whatever Holy Spirit called you to do, whatever Holy Spirit has anointed you to do, you may not be called to be what the Apostle Paul was called to be. You may not be called to be a preacher or a pastor or a teacher or any of these things that we see through Paul's life. But I promise you, God's got a plan for every one of us. He's been working that plan. He's been, oh hallelujah, there's been a process going on in your heart since the day you 
receive salvation and whatever God has called us to be, uh, we should do from his example. Let us fight uh, the good fight of faith. Hallelujah. Let us run our race. Uh, let us finish our course. Uh, oh, if you're determined today uh, to let God do everything he wants to do in your life, can you just sort of wave at me here just a minute, sort of wave back at me and say, Pastor, I'm not about to quit. Uh, I'm not about to find the sideline. Uh, I'm not about to get on the back. I'm ready for the front line uh, because uh, I serve the same God that Paul served, uh, and I'm in it to win it. Hallelujah. I'm going to fight the fight that God has called me to fight. Oh, hallelujah. Look at somebody and say, keep your boxing gloves on. Hello? You know, we got a famous boxer here in Louisville. He's not with us any longer, but everybody knew about the Louisville lip. Hello? Help me now, church. Float like a butterfly. Y'all know him. Yeah, I grew up with him. Sting like a bee. Amen. I remember when they had his funeral procession. It was just such an event. I don't want you to think bad of me, but, you know, I... I was just such an event. I just wanted to feel what was happening in the city. And I, I got out there on Bargetown Road and just watched that thing go by. Amen. There was one of those uh, uh, black African-American uh, um, actors in one of those limousines. Uh, he used to play Muhammad Ali in a movie. What was his name? Will? Will Smith. I almost high five Will Smith right there when he was going by. Had his window down. You say, well, that's kind of crazy. Well, I just, I just wanted to feel that. I wanted to understand a little more about what was happening in our city. And all oh, the crowds had gathered. And there's a lot of things that could be said about that. But one thing about Cassius Clay, he learned how to do this thing called rope-a-dope. And it looked like his, his, his guide had him pinned to the rope, and he would be... You know, just sort of covered up. But when the ladder, ra ladder rounds come around, amen, and his, his opponent, his enemy, had started tuckering out, then Cassius Clay started swinging back. Hell, amen. He, he was sort of, you know, just waiting for his time. He started swinging back. And he'd land the right and the left and the upper cut and the jab and, and all of those things. And he made that little strategy famous. Well, I want you to know, I, I know that Paul took some heavy licks. Uh, he took some heavy persecution. He took some things, amen, that some may have wanted to just count him out. Uh, but he looked to Timothy when he was about to give his last, uh, his last breath for the gospel. And he said, let me tell you something to encourage you. Timothy, if you want to accomplish something in your life greater than your then you keep fighting the good fight of faith. You keep in there. Amen. Oh, the enemy, he may land a blow or two. You may have to endure some things. But the God that I have served, Timothy, he's going to be with you. Hallelujah. In fact, Timothy, let me tell you something. He's not giving you a spirit of fear, but rather of power and of love and of a sound mind. I don't know who I'm preaching here to today, but I come to tell you, keep your boxing gloves on. On. Uh, keep fighting the fight of faith. Amen. Uh, keep looking the enemy in the eye. Don't you stop fighting, uh, but you continue to let the grace of God uh, give you the strength that you need. Oh, if you're glad for his strength, let's give him praise today. This same apostle said in Philippians, I can do all things. Hello? Through Christ. There you go, devil. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Church, I want you to know something. In this fight of faith, by the way, I'm not talking about a physical fight. I'm talking about a spiritual fight. We studied this a while back in our Bible study. We're in a spiritual warfare. If you don't believe it, just read Ephesians chapter 6. We don't fight against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's why we need all the armor of God. I'm just glad you've got your armor on today. 
the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the shoes of peace. Oh, hallelujah. You've got all the armor that you need. And he said, make sure you pray and supplicate and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen. Oh, there's times, you know, the enemy, he wants to fight us in the spiritual realm, and he wants to claim territory. But I feel like that old song today we used to sing around the church. I don't know about you, but I think the time has come. It's time to go to the enemy's camp and take back what he's tried to steal from us. I come to tell somebody today, your family is worth fighting for. Your grandchildren are worth fighting for. Your loved ones are worth fighting for. Our city is worth fighting for. Our country is worth fighting for. It's time for the church, hallelujah, to set our faces like flint uh, lay our shoulders back uh, and declare to the devil greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world oh anybody ready to keep fighting the fight of faith today Woo! glory to God our nation needs the church to fight the fight of faith We need to hold up high the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Amen. It has amazed me recently in our nation that was founded upon Christian bases, teachings. It's alarming some of the things that many people, individuals, in our country are trying to espouse as truth. Help me now, church. Anybody ready to fight the good fight of faith? And it's not a time for the church to be silent. It's a time for the church to cry out to God and to bend our knees and to be a light and to be a witness and to be a salt, amen, in a place that needs some salt. <laughs> oh, this world needs some salt. I hear people saying it's okay to have abortions. It doesn't matter if it's first term or second term or late term or even after it's come out of the, boo out of the womb. I declare to you before, hallelujah, before I was a twinkle in my father's eye, God had a plan and a destiny for my life. And God has a plan even for an unborn child. And it's time for the church to rise up and fight the good fight of faith. Oh, if you believe it, somebody give the Lord praise today. And that's just one thing. There's a host of things that our country, our nation that I love. And how many loves our nation today? I know you do. I love it. Oh, how I love America. Wouldn't live anywhere else. But oh, I'm praying. Holy Spirit, encourage your people to fight the good fight of faith.